So far in this class, we've studied a lot of different kinds of functions. We studied ordinary one variable functions, functions that go from r to r, something like f of x equals x squared, for example. So their input is one variable, and the output is one variable. You've been studying those kind of functions for a long time, certainly used them a lot in Calculus 1. At the beginning part of this class, we also studied functions that go from r to, say, r2 or r3. So their input is one variable, and their output is two or three variables. So for example, that would be something like f of t is given by the three-dimensional vector t, t squared, t cubed. We call those kinds of functions vector functions or vector-valued functions because we're thinking of their output as being a vector in R2 or R3. And in fact, we emphasize their vector output by putting a little vector arrow sign above the function name. Now, later in the class, we started looking at functions with two or three variables as input and one variable as output. So those would be functions that take R2 to R or R3 to R. For example, something like f of xy equals x squared plus y squared, or f of xyz equals x squared z plus yz. Those would be examples of that kind of function. We looked at that kind of function when we were studying partial derivatives and gradient and doing maximization problems. So those are the three types of functions we've studied so far. And now you can probably guess what the next kind of function is going to be. Well, obviously, it's going to be called a vector field. And it's going to have an input of two or three variables. But it's also going to have an output of two or three variables. So that would be some kind of function that takes, say, r2 to r2 or r3 to r3. Once again, because it has multiple variables as its output, we'll think of its output as being a vector, and we'll use a vector notation when talking about these kinds of functions called vector fields. So a vector field on R2 is a function, f, that takes R2 to R2. Or it could be a function that takes some set d to R2 where d is a subset of R2. Now for each point in the domain d, we're going to get an output that has two coordinates. We can think of those two coordinates as defining a vector. So it's kind of like we're attaching a vector or drawing a little arrow at each point in the domain. So this picture is an example of a vector field on a domain of R2. Uh, at each point, we have an arrow with a direction and a length. In fact, this vector field represents wind speed. Looks like there's a storm off the coast of Florida. Similarly, a vector field on R3 is a function that takes R3 to R3. Or it could be a function that takes some set D to R3, where D is a subset of R3. Once again, we can think of the vector field on R3 as a collection of, of vectors or arrows one for each point of the domain. Let's draw a picture of this vector field on R2 by drawing some arrows. I'll start by making a table of values. I'll plug in some values for x and y, and I'll figure out what the output f of xy is according to this formula here. I'll start with x equals 0, y equals 0, then f of xy is 0i plus 0j, or in components, 0, 0, the 0 vector. Kind of hard to draw that one, but I'll just put a little dot here. Now when x is 1 and y is 0, then I get the vector j, or in components, that's 0, 1. So at the point where x is 1 and y is 0, I have a vector going straight up in the j direction. When x is 0 and y is 1, I'm getting the vector i. So I can draw that when x is 0, y is 1, I'm going straight over in the i direction. Please pause the video and compute some other values for this table, maybe these ones. I get the following vectors as output for f. Now I'll draw them as arrows on my graph. 
To get a sense for what this vector field looks like, I need to draw a lot more arrows. And remember, they're not just arrows at the integer lattice points. They're also arrows when x and y are any kind of fraction in here. But my diagram is already starting to look messy, and that's partly because my vectors are so large and unwieldy. So it's a handy trick, instead of using full-size vectors, to rescale all the vectors when I draw them, so make them maybe as fourth, a fourth as long as they should be. That's a trick that a lot of graphing apps will use. Other graphing apps will use color to represent the length of vectors instead of actual length, just to keep the diagram looking more neat. So I'm going to erase all the arrows I drew and draw them back again, scaled proportionally smaller. I'll compute a few more values and add a few more arrows to my diagram. So I'm starting to get a rough idea of what the vector field looks like. For a more accurate picture, it's handy to use graphing software. Here I have a picture that I made using Mathematica. And here's the same vector field graphed with the Mac grapher, where color is representing length. In this class, you won't be expected to graph a lot of vector fields by hand, but you will be expected to identify whether the output of a software program actually matches the equation given so that you can tell when something goes horribly wrong. This video introduced vector fields, which are functions whose input is two or th maybe three variables and whose output can be thought of as a vector with two or maybe three variables. We also showed how you can represent vector fields as a bunch of arrows graphed on the plane or in space.